So the couple of things that I want to sort of preface this thing with here that you've got to consider is from a, a board perspective, um, you, you've got to consider a scale somewhere between an advisory board and a board of directors. Now, on the advisory board side, while it is often referred to as an advisory board, bear in mind that what really happens in most cases is that you have a board of advisors, in other words, a bunch of advisors, and you seek advice from them from time to time as an entrepreneur or as a business owner. Whereas when you're on this end of the scale, it's more of a formal thing. You bring the board together for a board meeting and they will sit and they will make decisions and so on and so forth. Now we can get into all sorts of technicalities around that, but when you are starting and growing a business, I see that in many cases it can be advantageous to start over here and you might just start with one advisor, maybe then add two. Maybe, and as someone said in a previous session, sometimes putting people on, I think it was actually Torb was mentioning in the beginning this morning, saying sometimes putting people on an advisory board is a great way to test them out. Do we work all right with these as board members? Because once they're sitting over there and sitting as a formal board, you know, around your boardroom table, things can get a little bit more complicated. Now, as long as you're the majority shareholder of a company, you can still kick them out. You can roll the board. But it's not a good idea to do so. Because it doesn't look good on your resume when you've done that if you're out there next month or a couple of months down the track raising capital. Oh, yeah, I just, oh, I think you had a board. Hey, I just, yeah, fired them. Didn't like them. Not a good thing to say. So be cons consider very carefully who you put on your board, not just do they look pretty, do they have great contacts, all that kind of stuff, but are they the kind of people that you actually want to sit with at midnight on a Tuesday discussing point 14 on the agenda when you really want to go home? Does that make sense? So you've got to think about that when you are establishing a formal board structure for your business, it might be a great thing to do, it might be the best thing you've ever done in terms of business growth, but it also creates an obligation you've got to report to your board what the hell you're doing. Just like you've got to report to the ATO what you're doing. It's not really that different. So, the other thing that I see that a, a lot of, and I'm just going to do a few drawings here and then we'll sort of open the floor to a whole bunch of questions. Um, the other thing that I see a lot of people go through the, 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 the business growth journey or the business startup journey and you start over here and, and you've got an idea, right? and you start developing that and you've got something that looks like a product and you start developing that and then now maybe you start developing a marketplace and you start developing that and so on and so forth and there's a journey there and if we look at the revenue then we probably see it down here for a while and stuff happens and you start going up and somewhere along this journey you're going oh shit we need to raise some capital we just talked about raising capital in here and we talked about Secession that, that Marcus just rang was about pitching for a million dollars. I know Neil talked about uh, raising funds as well. And you're going, oh, in order to raise capital, we need a board. And you start calling people around in a bit of a frenzy and say, ah, oh, who do you know? Oh, yeah, look, you look good, you can come on. Not a great strategy. Because, and I know this from very first hand experience, that if you put on a board, here that do not fit with you or do not fit with your business or do not fit with your strategy, you may suddenly find yourself in the middle of a capital raising campaign where you actually want to kill your board. And I know one in not one entrepreneur and I know her quite well and I obviously can't mention who it is, but you know, she ended up in a situation where basically, you know, she was like, you know, I have all these amazing people. I was so blessed that they wanted to join my company and sit on my board. And we're in the middle of this capital racing campaign and suddenly they want to go this way. And I'm going, no, 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 but they, my vision is this way. And it's this huge bust up. Do you think that was a good outcome? She was crying. 
This is not a good outcome. So start on this journey early. Even if it means you need to, you know, bootstrap something else. But consider a board much, much earlier in the journey. And here's the reason why. When I see a lot of companies, and whether that, whether that board is, as I said, maybe just as a couple of advisors, a couple of great advisors that you find. By the way, not necessarily your accountant. All due respect to Peter, but you know, accountants are great for looking in the rear view mirror. You want to have someone that looks front forward. Not all of us. <laughs> I think we call you a CFO. Last I checked. Um, CFOs are accountants that look forward. Um, for the record, you know, Neil's my best mate. I'll be, <laughs> be hammered if I didn't say that. Um, but yeah, what happens is, and, and we've actually just, we did some research on that last year, there's a remarkable difference between companies' growth rate with a board and companies' growth rate without a board. It's not necessarily quite as square faced as that, but it's remarkable. And I think the key reason that it's a remarkable difference is not because the business suddenly got better. But I think it's because there's someone questioning you as the founder, owner, entrepreneur, what the hell's going on? And pushing you on a little bit, saying, oh, do you think you could do better? So imagine the following scenario. You sit down one day in front of your computer and you're saying, by July, we're gonna do 500k revenue per month. Yeah, can you imagine that? Maybe it's right, not this July, but maybe it's a couple of years out for some of you. But you sit down and you make that commitment, say so definitely we're gonna hit half a million dollars per month. And then you go on with your work. And July comes along, and you're probably not there because you didn't really tell anyone. You committed to yourself. You maybe even written on a piece of paper on a whiteboard next to your desk. Imagine our scenario two. You sit in your board meeting, even if it's only just three people, whether you're paying them or not, but they're still your board. Maybe they're investors, maybe they're just in there. And you say, I will build it to here. What's the first question they're gonna ask? How? How? So you will be forced to figure out how. What's the next question they're gonna ask in a month's time? How are we going? How are we going, exactly. And you gotta go, working on it, right? Do you think there's a difference between scenario one and scenario two? Because I do. And I see it happen again and again and again. I'm not here to necessarily sell you on a board member, but it's just, it's a bit like, you know, some people hire me as, as a, what I call the accountability buddy. Do I make their business more brilliant? Maybe a tiny bit, but the really big bit is I say, how's it going? You done that yet? How's, uh, how, this thing you said back in December, you still haven't done it, what's happening? You know, listen, serious, I'm gonna get cranky. I mean, Jesus, what are you paying me for? He's not doing what I'm telling you. I'm sure James will have the same experience, a lot of his clients. I don't do a lot of that kind of work, but it's like we have the odd kind of one-on-one -on -one clients, and it's like, you know, my main contribution is, is being Jeremy Jimmy Cricket sitting on the, on the shoulders. Man, have you done it yet? Get around to it, boss, all right? Because there's entrepreneurs and there's business owners, and by the way, I'm one of them, and I have the same problem as everyone else in the room here. Because we're our own boss, we say, oh, yeah, it's not important, or busy. And we end up doing the things that we like doing, or at least we do the things we like doing first. Right? Am I telling something that rings true with some people here? Just, it's okay, if, if, I'm, if I'm the only one in the room, okay, I'll just, Join up to Entrepreneurs Anonymous up here. But it's like, it's something that all of us face. And if all you do is get someone that is as experienced as you or more, but is an accountability buddy. And that's what I think is a large element of the board. Now the board also fits in a whole lot of other things. James has mentioned before, you can could be raising capital, raising funds, you know, you, they might have contacts you don't have. Sometimes it's not raising capital per se, it could be raising deals. You know, what we work primarily when people come and say, can you raise capital, we say, no. Nope. And they go, but you told me you did. And I was like, no, nope, we don't. We raise revenue. 
because if we can't raise your revenue, we, we definitely cannot raise your funds. It's just not possible. Because I'm not a capital kind of person. I just make sure your business looks so great that someone who is a capital person will look at it and say, hey, I want to buy it, or buy a slice of it. That's my job. But in many cases, I can't do that without someone sitting on the board making the right kind of profile for that business. So think about this when you, when you go out there. Think about you want to get someone that you will enjoy sitting with in a board meeting at midnight on a Tuesday. Because it's this is what will happen. When the shit hits the fan, it will be midnight, even 2 a.m. before the damn board meeting closes. Are you prepared to sit there with that board member at that time? If not, please don't put them on your board. Even though they come with amazing credentials and stuff, but make sure you get someone they're willing to roll up their sleeves. Something that, 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 and we made a number of references to it. I mean, we run a program, you know, called Board Connector for people that want to join a board. And the reason we started that is 12 months ago when I did strategic planning forward for my business, I was saying, well, we're helping all these businesses grow. Part of this is I don't want to be the babysitter of all these businesses here. I need someone to put in, come on board these boards. That's why we started the program. But make sure you find someone that earned their crust. I know this may be not what you're thinking about when you're thinking about a board, but think about someone that can actually add revenue. No, we're not talking about a sales guy. We're not talking about a BDM, no. But sometimes, and I've seen it in many, many cases, you get the person on your board that brings the deal. And maybe that deal is worth half a million dollars worth of revenue, not in one hit, that would be highly unusual, but maybe over a couple of, a couple of years. But that was just one deal. But think about what that would have taken you or a BDM or even a team of BDMs to do over a whole bunch of small sales to get the same deal across. And that was just through connections. And the reason I say this is that you, when you put people on, whether it's an advisory function or whether it's over here, Put down what you want out of them. Make your shopping list. Make some bullet points saying, this is what I want you to do. Present that when you're sitting with them, say, hey, I'm looking for someone, I, I like the way you operate, I've had you recommended to me, blah, 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 but this is what I need you to do. Can you do it? And if they can't do it, and put their hand on the heart and say, yeah, I'm, I'm up for it, they're probably not a good fit. Does that make sense? So, I think I've talked enough. I want to open the floor up and get some questions happening in because I'm mindful again of, of our timing here. So who wants to be brave and put their hand up? Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, what's your name? Uh, Dominic. Dominic. Yeah. Um, advisory board moving into board of directors. Yeah. Getting that sort of selection criteria. So an, an advisory board, you know, you, it's obviously informal. You've picked a few people to, I guess, fill the gaps within the business. So it might be legal, it might be finance might be marketing, are you doing, are you setting the sort of same rough criteria in terms of assembling a board? Are you looking for that kind of representation in different areas of the business or are you just trying to get a, a, a good group of people together who can work together and work with you? I think it's far more important to get a good group of people together than trying to tick all the boxes. If you go and tick all the boxes strategy, you will end up with someone that just says, yeah, passed, yeah, passed, yeah, passed, because they, they, they're just going to be box tickets. They're just going to be, not because they're bad people, but because you ask them to just fit in their role, and well, they're doing what you ask them to do. Think about where is the greatest opportunity. If the greatest opportunity lies in, a, a, can you share with us what, what kind of business are you in? Or uh, we're in a te tech startup. Tech startup? Yeah. Say for argument's sake, your greatest opportunity is India. Imagine that for a moment that that's where your market is. Well, it might be very relevant then to get someone, some top Indian entrepreneur on your board because they can forge your connections because it's their own country, even if they may not live here, maybe they live here now. And whether they come within the same industry, a different industry, maybe less important. I'm not saying it's unimportant, but it's like, at the end of the day, it's about them understanding, you know, how we do business in India, who's the right people to talk to, careful with those over there, they buy them, whatever it might be. And because, you know, we come from here, we may not understand you know, the, the custom to, to enter into that market. So it really depends. It's like, you know, look for the greatest opportunity. And the greatest opportunity is really in, say, your legal or accounting. 
Would you then, depending on your business. Sorry, this is a, a yeah, follow-up question. Would you then, you know, do, would you then look to sort of offset some of that with with mentors or or advisors who still you know still advise you on a personal level? Um, no, oh, as directors, as founders, and have the board, you know, still performing its function, but looking to surround yourself with a, a bunch of other people as well. I would say yes, and it's not because I want to go on you, you to go and spend all your money on advisors and coaches and consultants. But I think for one, th something that I see happen for most entrepreneurs that, that I work with is that I might just create a little bit of space here. This doesn't work terribly well, as you can see. But it's a bit like, as we grow our business here, we have a somewhat parallel growth of ourselves. We may find in that journey here, let's say up here we get into capital raise stage, and you realize that I'm actually not a very good presenter. For argument's sake, I'm not sure whether you are or not. But so at this same stage, you're going, well, I really need to work on my presentation skills, and maybe you take 10 hours with someone who's a presentation coach. Or I mean, I'm right now working with someone who is a coach in in presentation and that kind of stuff. And you know, you know the reason and and you know her and I we sort of done a contra. I'm helping with her with some stuff, and she's helping me. Why? Because you know, in a spin-off business, to what we're doing, it's gonna we're gonna go out and raise something to the tune of ten million dollars in the next two years. I've never raised that kind of money before. It's kind of making me scared. It's like, whoa, that's a big number, right? And so I need to make sure that my language matches with the expectation of the investor that I sit with. It's kind of psychology 101. It's not, it's not rocket science in here. And I suddenly realized this woman, she knows how to teach me to get that language, that leveling in that language. And I go, hey, can we do a deal. And so sometimes, you know, one necessitates the other. And I am all in favor of pulling in the expert that you need at the time and then saying, well, when we're done with them, well, thank you very much, fantastic. You helped me a lot. It's been, you know, very, very valuable. And if he's an advisor or a coach, you obviously pay them along the way. And um, I think what I see some people do a little bit too easily is, particularly when you're in the early stage of the journey, you want to just get people on board, but you don't want to pay for it, so therefore you give away share capital. Personally, I think that's a very dangerous strategy <laughs> because you'll potentially end up with investors that you would rather not have as investors, and you're going to get in an awful lot of trouble getting rid of them. You know, maybe we need to edit that out of the footage here, but it's like, it's like, whoa, it's it's not worth the effort. You're better off getting another credit card and just putting it on there, and you say, I'll pay later. That's my five cents worth of it. Yeah, it's, you, you've got to be very careful on how you how how you give away your share capital. Someone else? Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. No, no. Sorry, this this gentleman down in the yeah, corner. Yeah, thanks. Uh, from being a director in a board, you have yeah. certain liabilities, right? Yeah. If you're an advisor, uh, what's the profile? Is the same liability? No. From a risk perspective. From a legal perspective. Legal perspective. Well, we've had this up for conversation a number of times and, and I've, I've asked around people that know a lot more about this from a legal perspective than I do. This simple way is that if it smells like a director, if it looks like a director, if it feels like a director, it is one. And ASIC doesn't give a rat's ass about what you call it. They don't care. So if you are joining a company in an advisory board function, but you are providing board of directors kind of functionality, services, and something goes ter terribly pear-shaped and you do, you do your due, due diligence, you are still just as liable as if you were formally appointed as a board, in, on the board of directors. No exceptions. And people have been prosecuted in this country, and a lot in the UK, mind you, which have a very identical legislation to here on that particular rule. James? And Mike, you can't write a contract on an advisory board to ex exo uh, exonerate you from any board decisions if you are sitting there and observing them. So I've seen some people say, oh, I'm only on the advisory board, so I have a contract that excludes me from liability. Not in this state or any state of Australia. <coughs> you, do that. No. you can't contract out of law. No. 
and they come down on that pretty damn hard. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean that you can't say acquire, like have someone that you hire as a coach or a consultant or a mentor or whatever not, and it's fee for service and they do whatever they need to do when they're out of there, that's fine. But it's about how those decisions are made and it's about the sort of the, 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 the balance of decision making. And they usually will also have their liability insurance anyway. Oh, they work there. you'd be well. weird if you don't. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sir? Um, what compensation do you expect to pay for advisors or versus board members? I think the, 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 the range is anywhere in this this realm here, 0 to 30k, and I can see a, a raised eyebrow there. Um, however, it doesn't mean you have to pay right now. Now, you will need to pay something along the way. But that's also why you need to have a good conversation with your incoming board member and say, can you actually do what I need you to do? But if that's the guy or girl that comes in that secures your patent, that gets your worldwide license rights, that you know, gets that JV deal with somebody else that you could never reach into, well, it's probably worth a lot more than this. And if they can be paid in two or three months or six months down the track when the deal is closed, you know, or maybe you paid a little bit now and a little bit more, much more later, don't, whatever. But it's the usual pay peanuts, get monkeys. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I know, it's a very overused cliche, but it's like, it is, it's, it's in that kind of realm. Yes, um, I have some clients, uh, insurance clients, uh, interest in my business. So I was wondering whether it's a wise or good or bad idea to invite them to be in my board. Their clients? Yeah, my clients. Can you share a bit more of what your business is? It's a software business. Yeah. So my clients use this, uh, so they pay, purchase my software uh, to run, to manage their business. And they believe in my business, so they want to be a part of it, in some way or the other. So I'm just wondering whether it's wise or I think there's there's two answers that I would give, and I would be very curious to hear both Lisa and James what they have to say on this thing here. But it's like my view would be, I, I would say no if if it's some kind of if there is even remotely potentially a conflict of interest down the track. The worst thing you can have is have your client on the board because Jesus, now we're going to fire this guy off the board, and you just lost a client. It's going to put you in a very very tight position. However, the, the opposite potential is that if this company that you're talking about that's one of your clients is say 100 times bigger than you and maybe they see you as an acquisition target and you can potentially sell your business into them, then yeah, it could be a trading relationship right now but if it means that two years down the track they're going to put down whatever X number of million dollars to buy your thing, well that could be a good strategy. So it depends. Anyone that would like to? I, I agree with you. Sometimes if you've got a big client who wants to be aligned with your business, you're better off to set up a client advisory board and take their input and get their guidance for, for the product and its direction. But that still keeps them arm's length from the insides of the business. I, I, agree, I, agree, with, I agree with what you've said and I agree with what James has said. You, you've got to keep them You've got to keep them interested, right? Because the last thing you want is them taking their money and building something like you've just built, which is a, which is going to compete. So somehow you've got to keep them interested, but I wouldn't invite them to be on your board. I would be saying, uh, you know, um, yes, I'm, I'm very keen to continue getting your information and get my product sold as quickly as possible into all of their outlets before they can have the opportunity to do anything else. And then they make suggestions about upgrades back to you. I mean, I've, I've set up a couple of client advisory boards in software businesses over the years, and it's a great strategy for pull, holding your clients very, very close. Yeah. But the difference is that when they're sitting out there, it's it's really it's an interface for you to get feedback and for you to sell into them and, and making sure that we sort of married like this. But they don't have financial information access. When they're sitting on your proper board, they do. First. Just um, one of the points Marcus brought up in the, the last presentation oh, yeah. was how would that last point sort of relate to that where you've got a way up, you know, your potential investor is someone who, who is already invested in your business in, 
in some relationship, would you still yep. be saying keeping them, at, keeping them at arm's length? Is that sort of a non-negotiable? Put them back to that advisory panel. Right. I mean, if you look at um, SAP and Oracle, there's two really big monsters that acquire companies. They regularly go on to advisory panels of companies they're looking at, and they'll sit on them for, say, two or three years, and then they'll decide that the company fits or it doesn't, and they'll make an offer for it. Yep. So they've had that great relationship that's been built, They've sold the products, they've provided input to the development of the product, but they've never seen inside the nuts and bolts of the company. They haven't sat at a board meeting and heard all the good and bad stuff that we hear at a board meeting, which probably they don't need to know. In fact, I would say in most cases, they don't need to know what goes on at a board meeting. They know what goes on in their own board meetings, and they're not nice either. And so it's, it's not, I mean, not saying that all board meetings aren't nice, but at a board meeting, you're discussing a lot of things, some of which we really don't want to be necessarily shared. Public, yes. So would it be, a, just, sorry, just a quick no, one. Would it be advisable to, so whilst you're, you've got the, the advisory board, the informal scenario, would you be recommending putting together a, a customer advisory board at the same time? Or is that? Some cases, yes. But I mean, you know, it, it's like, it really depends on your particular market situation. I mean, one of the companies we're working with at the moment is like, we may end up, they may end up in a situation where someone who is like a distribution channel will probably take a 20% stake in the company. Yes. But they look at that, well, it's a two way strategic play because if this means that the, the little company can grow like a thousand fold literally in size because now they got a you know us wide distribution channel right now there's a like it's a it's a local outfit in, in australia then hey if that's a trade-off that i need to do for you know giving away some of my my shares and be then you know yeah they're going to have a sticky beak inside my business but it may just not be possible to create that relationship otherwise you've also got <clears throat> um, companies that are from an investment perspective, like look at a big company like NASA, it's okay. And they'll look at the companies that are, you know, are leaders in, in a specific field, and they'll go and talk to them and, and, and work specifically with them to develop new products or services that are going to help build their business as to what they need. Because they know, as they're the business leader, then they're going to be ahead of everybody else and then everybody else is going to follow. But then at the same time, what they do is they might go and um, buy 30% of the company. So they're going to get um, to share in the profit from, from the growth of that business that they're helping provide the products to. So it's, it's a multiple um, wins for, for everybody that way. And they get the products that they want. So but when you're smaller and you haven't launched it, you're not going to have public share offerings. So there is nothing for someone that's advising you to buy into. And so there's, there's usually got to be some reason why they want to provide an advisory service to you. If it's a customer advisory panel, it's often different to a other business advisory panel. And the customer advisory panel will typically look at your roadmap and, and what your plans are and their things that you have announced that you're going to build, they're only giving you feedback on the timing and the look and feel, and maybe saying, well, there is a gap there. Whereas your, your business advisory people or a business advisory panel might be looking at totally different things. And then, of course, your board is looking at the overall operation and management of your team. Cool. Who's next? Yeah, you're all burning for the afternoon coffee, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes? I guess for a startup, I mean, yep. I mean the advisors usually cost you something. So, where would you put your weighting in a client advisory board versus a coaching group or what have you? Where would you put your interests? I think that would depend on what you feel is your need. Like, it could be as simple as if you've got a really honest friend who knows you but doesn't necessarily know you 
you know, who can still be neutral to you. Uh, it's not because we necessarily control freaks by nature, but because we've seen other people do stuff and things went, oh, that didn't go quite well. So next time we go, oh, well, I better make sure I keep a close eye on this process here, right? Someone's going to stuff it up. And so that's how we end up in that situation sort of gradually over time. And so the, the, the greatest thing we can do is that we'll, you know, get a staff member on board or get a consultant or advisor on board that says, oh, just, you know, just let somebody else do it. That's also why as a startup I often advise people to outsource stuff or outsource whatever and everything. But for God's sake, if you're not great at, you know, accounting or you're not great at marketing, well, there's lots of people out there, you know, often for the, for the price of 500 bucks a week, you know, which is minimalistic compared to what you pay for a full-time person. That will actually take the problem off your, off your, off your shoulder, and um, yeah, it's it's just working that system to your own advantage. Well, I guess I was thinking in your comments before. Um, what's important is to build early revenue so that you've got something to try. I guess play it on. Yeah. So is there a, you know, is that the advantage of the customer advisory? Well, if you don't have any customers, yeah, maybe you don't can't have a customer advisory, customer advisory board. I mean, I'm not trying to be cheeky here, but it's like customer advisory boards only work when you've got a certain level of volume. You've got to have, and you've got to have some big boys and big girls to sit on. Yeah, but also a customer advisory board sells when you are works when you're selling expensive stuff. If you're selling a hundred thousand dollar computer system. Well, someone would love to sit on your advisory board. I can assure you that because they're going to spend as much money. If you're selling a hundred dollar widget on a download, who gives a toss? Like, you know what's going to. So it's a very. It depends on the play. It depends on the type of play you're doing. Um, can you share what? what sorry, what, what's your business again? Uh, yeah, I guess we're, we're sort of uh, we're selling social network uh, analysis. Social network analysis. Yeah, sort of online thing. Enterprises. So, okay. So it'll be a, it'll be an enterprise sale, I guess. So yeah. Value, yeah. So once you've got the first dozen or so clients on board, that's probably when you want to start bringing them together, assuming they can sit in the same room without bickering. And um, so some of them can't, but you know, and maybe the first time you want to get three or four of them on, you know, in the same room. And sometimes you you will call it something differently, but you basically say, well, every quarter. You know, we're going to bring everybody together for a feedback session of some sort, right? Mm -hmm. So the first one, you know, maybe you got four to show up, and the next one you got six, and the next one you got eight, and suddenly this thing starts, you know, taking on life and so on. And who knows, three years down the track, you have a, what we, in the olden days used to call a user conference, right? It's like, whoa, didn't see that one coming, and you've got a hundred people showing up for the user conference. Whoa. But it's like, it, it, it needs to be that kind of progression. And and because you, you gotta you gotta build the internal m m momentum with with your revenue first, I think it's important. Last question, and I think we should break for that coffee and muffin or whatever's coming. One of the, the answers to that question yeah. is whether whether it's like, uh, look, I wear my, my badge on my shoulder. I am a business advisor. That's what I do. Um, but part <laughs> of it is goes, to right? ask yourself, what are you struggling with? And if you had a business idea and you've been sitting on it for more than twelve months you probably need an advisor. Because in this day and age, if you sit on a business idea for more than 12 months, it's getting very old. And you're probably, as Mike says, not got a, a voice on your shoulder keeping you accountable. But if nothing else, your advisor can do that, that for you. Um, part of the, uh, um, an advisor's role can be to force you to get customers. And why would anyone want to be forced to get customers? Well, very few entrepreneurs go into business just to develop software or develop a system or whatever. Most people have a view of making something out of it. If you're not making something out of it, maybe you need some help to get that going. And then it's taking you down the path that Mike talked about of, you know, you need funding, you need to grow. How, how should your growth happen? So maybe it's providing you with strategy advice if that's not what you do. And before long, you can see where it funds itself, where it compensates you for having it, and where it points you with various programs because they're the right thing for you to do. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's time for a cup of afternoon coffee.
Thank you so much for your uh, joyful participation.